Well, I'm joined now by Dr. Mark Hyman, who is the author of Food Fix, How to Save Our Health, Our Economy, Our Communities, and Our Planet One Bite at a Time. Dr. Hyman, welcome to the Climate Pod. Oh, thank you so much for having me. Well, it's so great to have you on. You know, I wanted to read Food Fix because it has this, you know, provides this incredible critique, this very thorough critique of our current food system and, and how to repair it. And I wanted to read Food Fix in part because we know that climate and our food are, are greatly interconnected. But one of the things that so resonated with me reading this book was how, I mean, you, you use the language that we hear as climate activists. And I, I wanna read just a quote that you have in the book. Quote, you, you write, quote, sometimes I feel like I'm standing on the beach watching a tsunami approach while everyone <laughs> around me is sunbathing <laughs> and playing in the water, oblivious to the implications of what is about to happen, unquote. And you're talking about food. And that's obviously something uh -huh. that we hear so much in climate. I mean, I felt like I was reading uh -huh. a climate scientist, but it made me feel this sense of urgency reading your book. How urgent is it to, to fix our food system right now? It's really extraordinarily urgent. Um, you know, COVID-19 has laid bare the vulnerability of our population because of chronic disease, obesity, which is driving most of the hospitalizations and deaths. And the reason we see chronic disease, probably at least 80% of it, and clearly obesity is because of the food we're eating which is produced by the food system, which is the result of our food policies. And so unless we address those root causes, we can do all the dancing we want around it and we won't get better. And the other aspect that's really urgent is the fact that our climate crisis is driven in large part by the food system, which is not really understood by most people and certainly wasn't by me because most of the focus has been on fossil fuels and reducing carbon emissions. But we can reduce carbon emissions to zero and we're still screwed unless we address, when I mean carbon emissions from you know, energy and fossil fuels, unless we address the contribution of agriculture, which is estimated to be anywhere considerably from 30 to 50% of all climate change and greenhouse gases from end to end. Whereas fossil fuels are probably a third food may be up to a half. And how is that even possible? Well, <laughs> we are in a crisis because our soil has been degraded to the point where we're losing most of the carbon that's been in the soils for thousands and thousands and millions of years probably, right? People don't understand that a third of all the greenhouse gases today that are in the atmosphere are the result of soil erosion. That, the, that we think of the rainforest and the deforestation as the big crisis. We're cutting down these trees that are storing carbon, that are carbon sink. The soil can hold three times the amount of carbon that's totally in the entire atmosphere, far more than every rainforest on the planet. And we've lost over a third of our topsoil. And it's projected by the UN, and you can estimate it, whether it's by 20, by, um, you know, 2080 or or 2100, we are going to be out of soil uh, in this country and globally. And if we're out of soil, we can't grow food. Uh, so we have this crisis of both, you know, the acceleration of climate change by the food system and the, the, the increasing food insecurity that's going to resolve the destabilization of our, our global population and hunger. And the fact that the way we're growing food, the very way we're growing food is impairing our future ability to grow food. So we might have to grow food in the North Pole and not North Dakota, right? You know, and that's my, the problem. And it's, you know, like, I, I love that you mentioned this. And you talk about this in the book. It's, it's soil, soil, soil. And it's the mm. way we are, are growing and producing our food. It's, it's not the mm -hmm. fact that we are growing and producing its food itself. So what is happening to cause this incredible amount of, of soil erosion? Well, well, it's the consequence of good intentions, which was the industrialization of agriculture after World War II, which was fueled in part by the development of, you know, large machinery and larger farms and uh, the ability to, to, you know, create huge um, industrial farms fueled by agrochemicals and improved seed breeding and, and ultimately GMOs. 
And the goal was to produce food for a hungry world, the Green Revolution. And it was this, this failed promise because yeah. we didn't realize at the time in the 50s that we were the DDT and these pesticides and chemicals were so harmful. <clears throat> we didn't realize that tillage, just tilling the soil, which we've done for thousands of years as farmers, is a bad idea. Uh, in fact, uh, if you till the soil, you cause the turning over the soil of the carbon that's stored in there from the plants and the animals, the microbiology of the soil gets destroyed. And that's really what's led to this. So this is massive industrial agriculture with the overuse of tilling of nitrogen fertilizers, of agrochemicals, pesticides and fertilizers that destroys the microbiome of the soil. It's like antibiotics for the soil. Yeah. Has led to this massive destruction of soil. So we've gone you know, from up to eight to 50 feet of topsoil in some areas of America that were laid down by the you know, 160 million ruminants that grazed the prairies and grazed over, over America. Now we're down to, you know, a few inches in some areas and we're really threatening um, our future uh, food security simply by what we're doing. And, and that is compounded by the changes in climate that result from it. So when you have one, the loss of soil, two, the increase in climate instability, which threatens our ability to grow food. I mean, you saw the million acres in 2019 that were unplantable in the Midwest because of the floods and the soil can't hold water. If you have carbon in the soil, they can hold 27,000 gallons of water per acre instead of it just running off or pooling on the top, which it does. So these problems are all interconnected. Right. So when you, I think people often silo these problems. There's climate change, there's chronic disease, there's environmental destruction, there's social unrest and structural uh, violence and racism. There's poor kids, academic performance, there's national security issues, there's our economic crisis. They're all related and they're all related by food yeah. and not, and to different degrees. Uh, but, but the, the food is a, a, the nexus where they all come together. Well, it's, it's remarkable. It, we're turning soil into dirt, right? And dirt is not the mm -hmm. same thing as soil. Yeah. Like as, as we, as we start to create, you know, unhealthy soil, how does that, what does that mean for what we end up consuming on our plates? I mean, does that, does right. that mean we're going to consume less nutrient yeah, food? Absolutely. So we've seen, we've seen since uh, even the last 50 years, the nutrient density of our food has gone down by 50%. So if you're eating broccoli today, it's probably half as nutritious as it was 50 years ago. Uh, and we're also seeing with increasing carbon in the atmosphere, we're seeing the increase in starch content because the plants eat carbs, they eat carbon, yeah. carb, carbon dioxide is carbohydrates. That's where you make that from is carbon, right? And so the plants get fat, literally a uh, full of starch and we eat that starch and we get fat. So the protein concentration is going down. This estimated we're gonna have, you know, hundreds of millions of people suffering from protein malnutrition because the protein content of the, even the grains and beans we're growing is decreasing as the temperatures heat up and climate, uh, climate gets worse. So we have, we have this sort of destruction of the soil and, and, and the soil, when you mentioned going from so soil to dirt, the reason that's a problem is that dirt has uh, very little ability to extract the nutrients in the soil for the plants and then in turn to us, right? So the, the soil is full of an array of microorganisms that's you know far greater than any other ecosystem on the planet, literally, billions and billions of organisms and mycorrhizal fungi and bacteria, and they all have jobs. They're all an integrated ecosystem. So the plant brings down the carbon from the, from the carbon dioxide that they breathe in, puts it in the soil, that feeds the microbes, that feeds the mycelia. They in turn extract the nutrients and give it back to the plant. So it's this beautiful symbiotic relationship. When you're trying to basically plant plants in, in sand, let's say, which is essentially what we're talking about, it can't do any of that. And so you've got to put on nitrogen and you've got to put right. on potassium and phosphorus and all these chemicals just to keep things going. So if we were able to restore the soil, uh, and this is a um, you know, UN estimate, which is, is staggering to me if it's true, that we have you know, about 5 million eight degraded hectares of land around the world. If we took two of those and we converted them to regenerative agriculture, which regenerates the soil, regenerates the ecosystem, produces healthier, better food, which is actually more profitable for the farmers to produce and reduces the use of agrochemicals. And, and it's just such a win-win-win. Um, if we did that, we'd be able to stop climate change for 20 years and kind of get our shit together, basically. And, 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 and that would only cost $300 billion. When you think 
of the, and that's globally, right? And this is not just in America. When you think we spent, I don't know, four trillion so far on COVID relief, when we spend three hundred billion on diabetes alone in this country, when you know the entire military budget of the whole world for sixty days is three hundred billion dollars, we can fix this, right? But it takes the understanding, the political will, and the right conversations. It is just um, extraordinary when you get into the book and you start outlining all of the costs, all of the costs to the environment, all the costs to our health yeah, system. It's staggering. remarkable. It's it's staggering. You're absolutely right. You know, in climate, we often talk about fossil fuel companies can deliver competitive energy prices for oil and gas because they have ex- externalities, right? They, they, they don't bear the cost when it comes to things mm-hmm. like the pollution and climate change that are caused from the burning right. of fossil fuels. And I was thinking about this reading Food Fix because you describe you know, how our food system is making us fatter and less healthy, but it's, it's also damaging the, the planet and hurting the global economy. And you talk about how we don't recognize the true cost and impact. What are some of the true costs and impacts that well, you are well, seeing to our health economy and planet? Well, let's just take corn, which uh, is, uh, you know, the major staple crop in our society. Uh, one, we, we, through our government policies, we subsidize the the growing of corn through crop insurance and other incentives. We are growing corn that is actually uh, not heirloom, you know, what they call Indian corn, Native American corn. It's it's uh, it's hybridized to produce the most starch content. It's not actually used mostly even for food. Very less than five percent is used for consumption as food, as we know corn, uh, as corn on the cob. Most of it's used in industrial food products, as high fructose corn syrup, as biofuels, as uh, you know, food additives, and so forth. Um, so when you grow corn in that way, you're growing it using these huge monocrop industrial farms, you're causing soil erosion, you're putting agrochemicals on, on the land. Let's, let's just take nitrogen, for example, in order to fertilize the corn with nitrogen, it, the, the, the main source of nitrogen production is, uh, energy required is from fracking. It's about 2% of our global energy use is just to produce fertilizer, which is 400 billion pounds a year. It's a huge industry. That fertilizer then, uh, that, that just the production of the fertilizer itself through fracking, fracking wells produce far more methane than, than traditional oil wells. So you've got that contribution. Then you put it on the soil, it turns to nitrous oxide. Nitrous oxide uh, is 300 times more potent greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. And then the nitrogen fertilizer runs off and into the rivers, lakes, and streams and creates these algal blooms which suck all the oxygen out, suffocate the uh, sea life in there. And in the Gulf of Mexico, we have a dead zone the size of New Jersey. There's 400 similar ones around the world that feed half a million people. We kill just in America over 200,000 metric tons of fish a year. That's just that's just like, we haven't even gotten off the farm yet. Okay? Yeah. And then you've got the, the glyphosate and the pesticides, the, the consequences of that to the soil microbiome, to destroying the soil, the soil erosion, the loss of carbon in the soil. Nobody's paying for all that. So that's just like, that's just even before it gets up. Then you get it off the farm and then it goes into industrial food. So it's really the main ingredient for industrial ultra processed food, which is 60% of our calories, which the government is keeping the prices low for. And then those calories in turn cause obesity. So, so people eat the most of those calories are the sickest, the fattest, have the most unhealthy metabolisms and are most likely to die and use healthcare. And then you've got the government on the other hand, subsidizing the consumption of these foods for the poor using our SNAP or food stamp program. So that is $75 billion a year, 75% of which is for mostly this junk food, 10% is for soda alone. Uh, and that is, you know, the, one of the biggest programs in the government is a, is a, it's almost a trillion dollar farm bill over 10 years. So there's that cost. And then of course, when those people get sick, because most of those people are on Medicaid, will end up on Medicare, the government pays for the, the, the sickness of those uh, and the sick care of those people with diabetes and obesity related illnesses. So we're paying uh, so many times as consumers, as as our nation, right? So we're, we're essentially privatizing the profits so that the food industry makes a profit and we're socializing the cost. These aren't really externalities. They, they, it's like calling things you don't like about drugs side effects. They're not side effects. They're just effects we don't like. And, and who is paying for those, right? Right now, um, the food industry certainly is not paying for those. And if they had to actually pay for the price of a soda, what is the price of a soda in terms of all those consequences and costs? 
uh, in terms of high fructose corn syrup, maybe a can of Coke would be a hundred dollars. Yeah. You know? <laughs> and I think we just don't, we don't appreciate that. And so we talk about free market economy and, you know, I, I think, yes, that would be great if we had it. <laughs> we don't. We have kind of have a rigged system where the incentives are misaligned uh, and, and we're incentivized to do the wrong thing instead of the right thing. Well, and we'll talk about in climate, hey, you know, it's great if you reduce your own carbon footprint. Those are great actions. But if without, you know, without federal and international policy to actually set great standards, have the right investments and center on justice, you're just not going to solve the problem. Just yeah. speaking of the United States, without a good national food policy, are our individual choices enough to get this done? No, listen, we can all become vegan. We can all drive electric cars. We can all... Um, and I'm not saying being vegan is the right choice. I'm just saying people think it is, but uh, it actually may not be the right choice for climate uh, regeneration, which requires animals to build soil. Uh, but let's say we all became vegan, drove electric cars, changed our light bulbs, you know, uh, it wouldn't matter. It, we, we, can't, we have to deal with these larger structural issues. Uh, and and, and if, if it's really true that the food system is 50% of climate change, uh, yes, we can change what we're buying that will drive the marketplace. And that is, in fact, General Mills and Danone and others are, are funding regenerative agriculture, which I find really inspiring and great because it means that they're waking up to the fact that their basically lifeline of supply chain is going to dry up if they don't change the way we grow and produce food. So I feel, I feel like, uh, you know, there's a lot of really exciting things happening, but we, we have to, uh, we have to really get real about uh, the, the nature of change that has to happen at a larger structural uh, and business innovation level and also policy level here and globally. I do want to talk about some individual choices because, you know, you talk about, you know, with new items on the market that are plant-based substitutes to meat. This has been a, a popular trend rate lately, lately, right? With meat, like the uh, the Impossible Burger for once. They tout yeah. environmental and health benefits and you yes. caution your yes. readers on yes. products like these, which I think honestly would come as a surprise to many people in the environmental movement. What worries you about some of the plant-based meat substitutes that have been introduced in <laughs> recent question. years? Well, I, I went to um, Starbucks this morning, grab a coffee and, uh, and they had the impossible little burger or sandwich, impossible sausage. And I'm like, oh, that's interesting. You know, it's a great sales job. Save the planet, save the animals, you know, be good for your health. I mean, it's just brilliant, right? Except it's not true. Um, yes, yes, using GMO soy for your burger is better for the environment than using feedlot beef, for sure. There's much less carbon emissions. But in a Qantas analysis that was done by an independent uh, life cycle analysis company that looked at both Impossible Burger and a regenerative farm, they found that, you know, while the Impossible Burger was better than feedlot beef, it, it, it was not comparable to regenerative beef. In other words, you would have to add, you would add three and a half kilos of carbon for one Impossible Burger, whereas you'd remove three and a half kilos of carbon with a regenerative burger. So you basically would have to eat one beef burger raised regeneratively to offset the carbon emissions of a Impossible Burger. That's just on the environmental issue. The second thing is the, you know, is it healthy? <laughs> you know, it's a science project, right? It's genetically engineered yeast. It's 47 novel proteins. It's um, full of glyphosate. Uh, in animal studies, the amount of glyphosate that is in the average Impossible Burger because they switched to GMO soy, uh, it's, um, it's 110 times what's required to kill the microbiome, which is critical for our health. Um, you know, so you're, you're, you're you know, you, you have better options, right? It's, it's, if you actually look at, at the regenerative farm, it, it provides a net benefit to everybody in terms of better quality food, just, just in terms of meat. I think the argument of meat, bad, meat, good, is, is very, very simplistic. And I talk about a lot of this. And on my podcast, The Doctor's right. Pharmacy, I have a number of podcasts discussing this with some real experts. One of them is Fred Provenza, who's it's called his meat medicine. And his, you know, I learned a lot from this guy who was a range line scientist who was in his 70s and studied, you know, how animals left to forage on lots of different plants, like literally hundreds of different plants uh, that are really, you know, grass fed and, and, and grass finished. They literally will have the phytochemicals from the plants that are in the meat. So their nutrient density and the quality is very different. If you eat kangaroo meat, 
uh, your inflammation markers go down. It's wild. If you eat beet lot beef, the inflammation markers go up. So the meat bad, meat good conversation is just, it's what meat and how was it raised? And, and, uh, and in fact, anybody who says that we can really reclaim and fix the climate without animals, you know, you don't have to eat meat. You can be a vegan if you want, but you, you can't deny the science around how we build soil. That's how we got 50 feet of topsoil in the Midwest was 160 ruminants to 60 million bison. I mean, we have more, almost as many bison as we do feedlot cows in this country, but we didn't have climate change. We didn't have carbon and the methane was actually absorbed through the methanotropes in the right. soils. You know, they were eating different plants that have changed the methane production. So, you know, we have to give antibiotics to cows so they don't blow up from all the gas production because we're feeding them a diet that's the wrong diet. But it, if you look at the science around regenerative agriculture, it's pretty clear that that you know it, it is a it is a major force for change, and it will not only uh, help us one uh, put carbon back in the soil and sequester carbon, and be one of the major ways to draw down carbon. Two, it will conserve water, which we're seeing increasing droughts and water shortages across the world. Three, it'll protect our waterways from eliminating all the nitrogen runoff. Four, it'll it'll help produce higher quality, more nutrient dense food than the traditional farms. So people are healthier. So it's a kind of a win, 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 win. I'm, you know, I, I'm a fan of, of any innovations that will help, but I, I do not think that, that certain kinds of factory made meat is not, are, are actually a good idea as an occasional treat or something fun. But the thing is, is the, the solution for, climate change uh, and, to, and to, to, to understand their rhetoric in, this, in, the, in the context of the science is just unfortunate. Yeah, I mean, it, it seems to me like the, the meat versus no meat conversation distracts from the factory farming versus regenerative agriculture conversation, right? Exactly, and I, exactly. And I love how in the book you, you talk about you know, the need to de democratize and decentralize food production. That is mm -hmm. how we can you know, produce food at scale and also help water, soil, and fighting climate change. Earlier in our conversation, you were talking about how regenerative agriculture actually yields a, a better return to the farmers themselves. How mm. does you know how does that you know democratic approach to food production lead to some better results? Well, you know, we have to realize that it, most of the world's food is produced by small farm holders, and the smallholder farms run mostly by women, <laughs> which get very little support and feed their families and their communities, and they're done really in, in ways that are using long-standing traditions. And where those traditions have been usurped, like in India and other places, and they've, they've, they've gotten the farmers to use agrochemicals and GMO seeds, very quickly, they, they've not been able to keep up or sustain, and they often uh, go bankrupt, and they have extraordinary high rates of suicide. So in terms of the, the question, how do, we, you know, how do we actually create a model that works, I, I think we, we, we have to encourage through incentives in the government farmers to transition to regenerative farms. And it can be small farms, it can be a little bit larger farms, but it's really the methodology that has to be incentivized so that farmers can get trained, they can have the right incentives. And, and the Soil Health Academy run by Gabe Brown and Alan Williams and Ray Archuleta and others is training farmers around the country to implement these practices. And they're finding that these farmers um, are, are finding within the first year they're profitable. Uh, and, and they, you know, farmers are not the bad guys here. They're the victims. So they're locked in between the, the banks, which um, they need to get loans for buying their seed and equipment and chemicals and the crop insurance, which they need to protect their farms. And to get the loans, they have to have crop insurance. So they came and not get it. And then they're a conduit for all that money that doesn't go to them. It just goes to the seed and chemical companies. And they end up, you know, on the average farmer makes minus sixteen hundred dollars a year. So, uh, we, you know, we're in a really shitty, uh, shitty cycle with these farmers that they, they're disempowered, they're disconnected, their profits are going down, their average age of farmers is going up, and now there's there's kind of a, a resurgence of a new movement of regenerative agriculture. Kiss the ground, which is a recent movie that was out. I was I was in that movie, but I was really sort of talking about the solution. But I think the main challenge is that we're so, so still silo there's regenerative ag and then there's like chronic disease and health and economy like it's all one problem like you fix agriculture you fix human health you fix the economy you fix education you fix national security because 
you know, 70% of recruits are rejected for service because they're too fat or unfit to fight. Well, these are real things that are happening. And I think even our divisiveness in our society uh, is, is a result, and we're seeing this right now, is a result of uh, the, the pollution of our brains by the food we're eating. And yeah. we know that the kinds of foods we're eating activate our amygdala, they activate our fight or flight response, they activate fear, they activate reactivity uh, and, and impulsivity and violence literally violence uh, is is activated by processed foods and we know this from prison studies from juvenile delinquent studies where they swap out the foods and they see you know 90 percent reductions in violence just by e eating healthy so we're talking about like wow maybe this is all connected you know maybe it's we have to start to sort of connect the dots here and this is really what the book's about and it's also about understanding how we how we can solve the problem because it's not called food apocalypse it's not just about the problems it's about what are the really clear solutions and pathways that individuals can take that businesses can take that philanthropists can take and that policymakers need to take to actually change the situation yeah and you have great you know great policies that could be enacted so what is it you know that's going to stop better policy from being enacted well the number one lobby group in congress by far, probably by twofold, is the agriculture and food industry. They far exceed any other industry. And, and they're not gonna go slowly you know, into the night. I think they're gonna need to be brought along. They need to be supported with corrections of incentives. They need to be encouraged through consumer uh, activism and demand, uh, and they need um, lawmakers to sort of step in and, and deal with these things. Uh, but there is gonna be a lot of resistance. Um, but, but I think I, I do have hope because I do see a lot of food companies trying to pivot and shift and be more innovative. And you know, it's hard, like if, you're make, if you make sugar water, it's hard to figure out what to do with that to make it not so bad, right? <laughs> you put less sugar, <laughs> you give stevia or whatever, but it's like, it's not really the, the solutions we should be looking for. So I think, I think um, you know, there, there is gonna be a lot of resistance and, and, and who knows what happens um, with the next uh, administration, but, but there's a real opportunity for us to do this. And, you know, just even uh, thinking that, you know, we're, we're, we're the second greatest polluter uh, in that climate change in the world after China. We're probably number one when it comes per capita, you know, if you were to look at per capita. Um, and, uh, and yet we're 5% of the population producing 25% of the greenhouse gases. You know, we've got to do something here in this country to deal with this. And, and again, a lot of it is, is related to the agricultural industries where the breadbasket of the world. Yeah, and I think, you know, it, it, it's interesting even how you talk in the book about agricultural production. And not only can, you know, regenerative agriculture help us, re, you know, reduce or to draw down uh, greenhouse gas emissions, but you also talk about how agriculture can use the, the green power revolution, you know, re-solarizing agriculture production. How can food producers, if they're incentivized properly, leverage things like renewable energy to help up, you know, help clean up agriculture's impact on climate change as well? You know, it's a great example is food waste. Um, and, uh, you know, food waste accounts for, you know, significant amount of greenhouse gases. If it were a country, it would be the third largest emitter of greenhouse gases after Crazy. the US and China. And essentially, it's from your food scraps and vegetable waste being thrown in landfills producing methane uh, and off gassing. That's it. All right. And in fact, uh, people don't realize this, but you're, if you're, even if you're a vegan, your food scraps going into the, into the, uh, Food landfill instead of compost produce three times three times as much methane as cow farts and burps, you know, as factory farming. So we just got to get real with the numbers. Um, and and I think you know if we <clears throat> look at the innovations that are happening, they're business innovations. A company called Vanguard Renewables in Massachusetts uh, took advantage of a law that was passed that if you were in Massachusetts, that if you were producing more than a ton of food waste a week, you couldn't throw it in landfill. You had to dispose of it through composting or through other something. You had to deal with it, feed it to animals. And so now all these big grocers and food service companies have to deal with this stuff. Uh, and, and so Vanguard Renewables partnered with local dairy farms, which were losing money. People are drinking less milk. And they put on these anaerobic digesters, which take the food scraps, mix it with manure, throw it in there. And it basically is like a combustion system that produ produces on one farm electricity for 1500 homes, gives the farmer free energy, makes the farmer hundred grand, Vanguard Renewable sends that energy back to the grid, they make money. It's a win, win, win for everybody. And in, in, there's a few of those in America. In Europe, there's 17,000 of these anaerobic digesters. 
you know, we should not be throwing away any food scraps in landfills. We should not, I mean, 40% of our food is wasted. And there's a lot of reasons for that that are different in developed and developing countries. But, you know, we are really suck at that. And so I think it's really important for us to get smart about how to not have as much food waste and to take care of our food. And I described some of that. There's great techniques like Appeal Sciences has a special coating that's a plant-based coating on things to keep it last longer. There's fresh paper, which is a little piece of paper with herbs and spices that actually keeps the, the food fresh. I, I found by just getting these little plastic containers that or you can get glass ones, but they're like lock, seal locked with air. I'll literally do an experiment where I put like I bought parsley and cilantro and I put it in there and sealed it when I got it. And then I put some in the drawer in a plastic bag and the one in the drawer just rotted pretty quick when the, and the other one just lasted for a long, long time. So I think we can learn ways to reduce our own food waste by what we need. But I think we, we, we really have to, uh, you know, think about some of these innovations that can help to, to actually uh, make the agriculture a solution, not a, a problem. Yeah, and it's taken the air out of the arguments that these giant monopolies were going to end world hunger, and instead we have we still have a tremendous amount of hungry people and this extraordinary amount of food waste. So it's just a reminder about how much uh, that argument does not hold up. But I wanted to talk a you little know, we, bit. We make 720 more calories per person a day than we need. We could feel 9 or 10 billion people today on the planet if we didn't screw up a food system. Yeah. It's 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 so wild. So I want to talk about your assessment of you know the climate and environment movement. You know, as you mentioned in the book, there wasn't um, strong food policy. The, the Paris Agreement didn't address food policy. Mm -mm. How much does it frustrate you that you are not seeing this conversation in you know in major climate environment agreements or in the conversation around climate? How much does it frustrate you that we're not talking more about food? Well, I think in the five years or so since the climate, uh, Paris Climate Accord, there's been an increasing awareness of this, even in the last couple of years. And I just virtually attended the Climate Underground Planting the Future, which was Al Gore's climate conference. And it was all about food. It's all about food and food system and all about these issues. And I was like, wow, this is great. You know, this is a real conversation. And he began to understand. He even said, you know, he, he said in his calculations, it was about a third of greenhouse gas emissions are from the food system which is a lot when you think about it, right? A third, a half, whatever, it's, it's enough. And, and there, you know, even like, in other words, even if we stop emitting all the fossil fuels today and carbon emissions and switch to 100% renewables, we still wouldn't be okay. The climate is still too hot. We need a solution that is fixing by drawing down carbon and getting rid of carbon. And it's not these, bazillion dollar carbon capture technology solutions, which, you know, like they're going to build these machines all over the planet. And like some people are going to make billions of dollars and it sounds all sexy and great, but you know, we can use this, this carbon capture technology that's available everywhere, almost everywhere on the planet. It's, you know, uh, more effective than any other carbon technology. It's free. Uh, it's, it's been around for, you know, billions of years and it's called photosynthesis. <laughs> <laughs> and it's really pretty simple <laughs> where the plants breathe carbon dioxide and we put it in the soil and we put it in trees and in the soil. It's not that hard. And, and we just know, we, we know how to do it. It's not like we have to have new technology or invent new science. We just do apply what we already know in a systematic way. Yeah. You have direct, direct uh, air capture just in your backyard, right? That's uh <laughs> So, you know, obviously we talk about, uh, I, I love what Bill McKibben talks about when he talks about, you know, individual actions on, on climate policy. And his recommendation is organize, organize, organize. We've already talked about, you know, how our individual food decisions, uh, they, do, they do matter, but it's not sufficient. So what is the best thing for our listeners to do that, that, that can help drive better food policy and a better food system? Yeah, well, the election just happened. I was heartened to see that 160 million Americans voted more than since... 1908 and any other election. So people can be activated. I think that that um, people often feel powerless and disempowered and their vote or their voice doesn't make a difference, but it really does. And if you, and I've been in Washington enough times and talked to enough people that if, you know, 10,000 people call a senator or congressman's office, they listen, yeah. they pay attention. You know, if they get 10,000 people's a mail or they get a petition or they, it, they care. And, and they are only buffeted about by the, the industry, which is their main 
source of information. And so if they're getting other edu source of education information, I think we have a way to influence them. And I think we need to use our voice. We need to use our vote. Um, and we need, you know, there's groups called, called foodpolicyaction.org. Uh, and and, um, and they, are, they are extraordinary because they've literally graded all the senators and congressmen on their food and ag voting and policy records. And they have called out people who were undermining what we really need to be doing. And, uh, and I think they have gotten them out of office simply by using social media campaigns. So we, we have more power than we think. And I think um, wherever you want to be active, whether it's in your school, whether it's with your local town, you want to start a composting in your local town, start a community garden. You know, I mean, when you think about the food scarcity issue, I mean, 40% of our food in this country was grown in victory gardens during World War II. The government said, everybody grow their own food. Yeah. You know, we need to you know, put our industrial resources into building ships and planes and boats and, you know, and, and jeeps and tanks and, shit and guns. And we did. Like, it's amazing. I mean, when you think of like what's happening with COVID now, it just makes me mad because, you know, during, during World War II, Ford, Ford Motor Company shifted what they were doing and they were able to build a, a bomber every 64 minutes. <laughs> We can't even get enough masks and gowns to protect our healthcare workers and enough tests to test our population. Uh, it's, it's just staggering to me how corrupt and, and dysfunctional our government is that it hasn't really mobilized to, to really create a coherent response. And I think the beautiful thing is if we as, as individuals are, are, are vocal, if we organize, if we, if we act, uh, where we all can act, whether it's, it's in our own kitchen whether it's in our communities and our schools and our workplaces, whether it's with our local governments, whether it's more on a, a bigger scale, whether you want to run for office. I mean, I think these are these are all things that are available to us and I outline what they are. And if people go to foodfixbook.com, they can download the food policy action guide, which is a great, oh, sorry, the food fix action guide, which is a list of actions for individuals, governments, businesses, and so forth that can really make a big difference in changing our food system. We'll definitely link to that just for people who are going to go make choices for their their diet after listening to this podcast. What are some of the best principles to think about when you're thinking about buying food for a lower carbon footprint? That's a great question. So I read a book uh, called Food, What the Heck Should I Eat? And a new book is coming out, The Pig and Diet, 21 Principles for Eating in a Nutritionally Confusing World. They have a whole section. One of the principles is how to eat like a regenitarian. And so no, you know, nobody can be against that. You know, you can't, <laughs> um, how can you can be against being paleo, you can against being vegan, you can be against being car, low carb, high carb, but you can't be against being a regenitarian to regenerate human health and reju regenerate planetary health. The question is how do you do that, right? So it's really about the small choices we make and in and, and those little things, you know, for example, uh, I went to the farmer's market and I ordered from the local farmer who raises grass fed lamb, I ordered half a lamb that I have to go pick up on Saturday and I'm going to bring that and put it in my freezer and I'm going to eat that. So I bought direct from the farmer. I know it's local. I know it's regeneratively raised and I can you know, make some small contribution. I have my own little garden in the backyard. I don't mow my lawn anymore. I, you know, I'm doing simple things. I have a compost pile. I, uh, I shop when I can uh, through, for example, thrivemarket.com where they offer regeneratively raised and sourced ingredients and meat. Uh, you can get stuff from Mariposa Ranch. And there's a lot of resources in the book of things you can do. And right now, you know, 1% of our food supply is regenerative. So it's not available widely, but it will go from 1% to 2% to 10% to 20% to hopefully 50, 70% if people start to ask for it and demand it. So I think that's that's all going to drive change. Awesome. Well, again, the book is Food Fix. We we just scratched the surface, but again, the, the book is Food Fix, How to Save Our Health our economy, our communities, and our planet one bite at a time. You are at Dr. Mark Hyman on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter, and uh, you know website um, at drhyman.com, uh, Dr. and the book website, again, is foodfixbook.com. Dr. Hyman, thank you again so much. You are so good at talking to climate people. That is exceptional. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much again yeah. for joining the Climate Pod. Okay, thanks so much for having me.